Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Anna Eldridge. I'm the policy lead at Plant Life, focused on grasslands and agriculture policy here. Um, I'm so pleased that you can all join for a really interesting session on grasslands as a nature-based solution and how grassland restoration can help with addressing climate change and ecological degradation. Uh, Plant Life is a charity that raises the profile and protects the future of our wildflowers and plants from meadows to mountains, road verges to our gardens. We're working across the UK. Uh, to save wildflowers, plants and fungi. And for this session, I would also add that we're working internationally uh, because we've got some wonderful voices uh, from around the world to emphasize what work is being done on grassland restoration and the importance of grasslands across the world. Uh, so I'm going to start today uh, by sharing um, a short video on grasslands just to set the scene and then I'm going to introduce my fantastic panelists for the day. So hopefully this will all work seamlessly, but you never know with digital technology. So. Well, I am going to introduce my uh, panelists now. Uh, so we have joining us today, Jill Perkins from the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, Precious Fury from Earth Wisdom, Lisa Norton uh, from the British Ecological Society and David Weldman from the University of Nebraska. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to have each of them uh, speak around their uh, sort of areas of expertise and, and share some of their stories with you and then we're also going to use the chat um, and Q&A to raise any questions that you have um, and hopefully our panelists who aren't speaking and some of my fantastic plant life colleagues uh, can jump in and give some answers as we go so please feel free to raise any questions that you have uh, and and keep it uh, keep the conversation going um, so just as a quick sort of frame, um, as you saw in that video that we've produced for COP26, globally 34% of land carbon is stored in grassland, making them a very powerful carbon sink. In grasslands, 90% of soil of carbon is held in the soil with 10% in the vegetation. So that really emphasizes how important it is to have healthy soils, but yet much of our global grassland soils are degraded uh, so we need to work to restore soil health so that we can draw atmospheric carbon down and lock it away in the soil as a carbon solution. And since permanent species rich grasslands absorb and store more carbon than monocultures of grass, we need to invest in our soils and restore, maintain and protect our species rich grasslands around the world. And so now I'm going to hand over to Jill uh, to present our Grasslands Plus campaign. As CEO of Bumblebee Conservation Trust, Jill has found the perfect channel through which to promote her passion for bumblebees and their protection. As an enthusiastic vegetable gardener and amateur botanist, Jill knows that we can all help reverse the declines in bumblebees by taking small actions and the importance of understanding how these special creatures give so much to us human beings through the simple act of pollination. So now I will hand over to Jill. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Honor. Uh, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. Let me just make sure that the screen is correct. Everybody see everything okay? Excellent. I'm a very positive sort of person, glass half full, gets the finance people at the trust rolling their eyes when I present my business confidence report and my staff excited when I rock up at the office waving my arms and declaring I have a brilliant idea. I should say excited for a moment till they realise the work that might be involved in developing my brilliant idea. But conservation, working in and with nature is predicated on optimism and belief, and these need regular injections of good news to keep us all focused and alive to the challenges, turning nature around to flourish again. Now, of course, I often think of bumblebees when I need such a boost. Bumblebees can be the embodiment of that belief from the lowest and most pessimistic point in their fortunes, a succession of measures, no one of which would work by itself, is bringing back some of our rarest bumblebees. So I really, really wanted to start this presentation with some forward thinking, exciting options for persuading those who have the influence to, to declare grasslands a priority solution in the struggle for reducing carbon across the globe. I have mentioned it before in my talks, but I am going to say it again. We all of us here need to call for transformative action as we all of us here need to take action. I'm gonna sound a bit like a zealot, but if we don't believe we can achieve what at first glance looks like impossible changes to save our planet, then we might as well all go home now. This time I have with you is less about how awful things are and more about what we can actually do to change things. We have the power to make change individually and together. When Ian Dunn, Chief Exec of Plant Life, brought forth the idea of the coalition, Plant Life, Butterfly Conservation and Bumblebee Conservation Trust to raise awareness of the necessity for grasslands, it definitely made me more optimistic that we can start pushing an open door to success. And I still believe that. Grasslands Plus was born and has done remarkably well in a very short space of time. Our focus and our message was simple and clear. Protecting and restoring meadows and grasslands is essential to the fight against climate change. Grasslands sequester carbon, enhance biodiversity and contribute hugely to the beauty of the national and international environment. We wanted to tell the government to make grasslands a priority at COP26. And we have had some significant successes. Press coverage, we have had over 7,500 plus petition signups, 80, 87 NGOs and other organizations supporting us. We've raised money through our, uh, our GoFunding, early day motions tabled at both Westminster and at Holyrood, and some very high level meetings with influential conservative environment network. Our estimated media reach, 13 million plus. That is no mean feat in the short time that we've had this campaign starting. I wanted to give an example of how important internationally grasslands are, and I hope I'm not stealing any of David's thunder who's coming on later. But the most recent example of grassland loss comes from America. Look at that. It's a, it, it's a hidden destruction. We're losing grasslands in the US at a rate of half a million acres a year or more. I think that's an amazing statement. Uh, and that's from Tyler Lark, a, a, a scientist from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Lark and his team of researchers use satellite data to map the expansion and abandonment of land across the US and discovered that 4 million hectares has been destroyed between 2008 and 2016. So large swathes of the United States Great Prairies, which I don't know whether you did, but I certainly learned about, about them at O-level geography, and I do mean O-level geography, was one of the, the, the major examples of fantastic grasslands when I was at school. So there's been changes in land and sea use has been the main driver of, of this biodiversity and ecosystem change. Uh, and I think it's three quarters of the land-based environment and about 66% of the marine environment significantly altered by human actions. 
So these lovely North American grasslands often referred to as prairies are a case in point and their findings really demonstrate a pervasive act pattern of encroachment into the areas that are increasingly marginal for production but highly significant for wildlife. So there's these boggier areas across the country as well, in, our, in the UK as well, boggier areas of land or those with uneven terrain, you know, these have been traditionally left as grassland. But in the past few decades, this marginal land has also been converted to agriculture as well. So these grasslands are rich, also rich in habitat in the US for the monarch butterfly a flagship species for pollinator conservation and a key indicator of overall insect biodiversity. More than 200 million milkweed plants, the caterpillar's only food source, were probably destroyed by cropland expansion, making it one of the leading causes for the monarch's national decline. And there was a, there was a statistic, the extent of conversion of grassland in the US makes it larger Makes, makes it a larger emission source than the destruction of the Brazilian Cerrado, according to research from 2019. About 90% of emissions from grassland conversion comes from carbon lost in the soil, which is released when the grassland is plowed up. So there was a statement, the rate of clearing that we are seeing on these grasslands is on a par with things like tropical deforestation, but it receives far less attention I'll just say that again. The rate of clearing that we're seeing on these grasslands is on par with things like tropical deforestation, but it receives far less attention. And I think when we started Grasslands Plus, why wasn't grasslands in the news? Why is the widespread lack of awareness of the importance of grasslands uh, among policymakers, managers and people down? Is it down to the lack of research or science? Is it because they are so easily transformed into food production? Is it because it's a lot harder to measure or put a value on areas of grassland, whereas you can easily plant and count trees? I don't know the answer. I do know that we all have the power to raise the awareness to the people that matter. Grasslands are threatened by habitat loss, which can be caused by human actions, such as unsustainable agricultural practices, overgrazing and crop clearing. So almost half of all our temperate grasslands and 16% of tropical grasslands have been converted to agricultural industrial uses. And only 1% of the original tall grass prairie exists today. Apparently, and I read a lot of science material, so um, I have to take notice of some of it. And the Trust is a science-based and evidence-led charity. So apparently there are two key systems that need to fundamentally change. And this is from Craig Hansen, Vice President for Food, Forest, Water and Ocean. Note that there's no mention of grasslands in his brief. Craig says it essentially comes down to two things creating sustainable energy system and a stable food system. Creating a sustainable energy system and a stable food system, massive. How we grow food, how we power our lives are the things that are most critical to get that right, to have a livable planet. Like me, Craig is optimistic. He says the issue isn't technology or money, it's political will and consumer choice and demand. Humanity has a knack for solving the most vexing challenges just in time. I don't think we should take that for granted. Grasslands Plus, the campaign, was just the start of getting under the skin of these influencers, really raising the awareness of how important grasslands are, not just in this country, internationally. Our impact, our human impact is so well document, documented, but our actions to change things are not easy. Grasslands Plus has given us an easy way to help people to realize the importance and to make that change. 
So I think Grasslands Plus campaign has provided very positive action, something we can all get involved in, something we can all act for. Its simplicity, its clear message has made it one of the most successful campaigns I've been involved in. And I very much hope it will continue substantial and real progress, even after COP26. I hope you'll all join in helping us to achieve even more success. Thank you. That was absolutely wonderful, Jill. Thank you so much. Um, you said that you were feeling optimistic about COP26. Um, and I just wondered if you would answer uh, sort of what it is that you want to see coming out of it and how you think we can achieve that. I, I think if I, I'm sorry, I have to go back to Grasslands Plus campaign because, you know, our high level, absolute star shot coming out of COP26 was that Grasslands Plus or Grasslands will come out as a policy to, re, to, to support climate change, along with trees, peat, grassland. If, we, if I can have that, trees, peat, grassland, I should be really happy coming out of COP26. That's absolutely fantastic, thank you. Um, so now I'm going to ask Lisa Norton to speak um, and she's going to be presenting about uh, grasslands as a nature-based solution. So Lisa is a senior scientist at the Land Use Group at CEH where she has worked on the, as a plant and landscape ecologist for over 20 years. Her research focuses on large-scale monitoring and the sustainable environmental management of farmland for which she has worked closely with social and economic scientists and stakeholders in an interdisciplinary approach. She recently completed as PI, a global food security funded project, sustainable economic and ecological grazing systems, learning from innovative practitioners. Uh, so I'll hand over to Lisa. Hello, can you see the slide? Um, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, so the, uh, this talk is a, a joint effort, really. Well, the, it reflects work that I did for the British Ecological Society's report on nature based solutions. Uh, and that work was done primarily with Sarah McCain at the BES. Um, so I'm not claiming all the credit. Okay, so grasslands, as we've just said uh, very well, uh, are extremely important. They're extremely important in the UK as well as internationally. And in the UK, they cover around 40% of the UK land area. Uh, and they include a range of different grassland types. Um, and these have been sort of aggregated or grouped into broad habitats uh, and different and, and they include things like moorland grassland and acid grassland, neutral grassland and improved grassland and calcareous grasslands. And you can see them from the percentages there that uh, improved or agriculturally improved grassland is, is the one that is the most extensive in the UK at 20, over 20%. 20 um, only 2% of our grassland is considered species rich or semi-natural in the UK. And that includes grasslands like hay meadows or lowland and upland calcareous grasslands. So these figures here are from the countryside survey, the UK countryside survey, which uh, studies the wider countryside and, and has done for decades. It's, it's currently on a rolling program, but its last full survey was in 2007. And these results come from that. Uh, and within the countryside survey, we do some very large plots, 200 meters squared. And you can see that um, different grasslands have different numbers of species in the UK. So the agriculturally improved grassland tends to only have about 14 species in those 200 meters squared. Uh, neutral and acid grasslands uh, have slightly more at 20 species and calcareous grasslands have a lot more. At 43, with that, with those uh, underlying rock types being particularly good for species diversity. In terms of soil carbon, in our more widespread grasses, so this isn't the uh, semi-natural uh, grasses. This is, although semi-natural are a subset of neutral grassland actually, but they are for our, our most widespread grasses. For improved grassland, we have 67 tons a hectare as measured in the countryside survey and neutral it's 68 tons per hectare. So um, those, those two 
parts of grassland are the most prevalent in the UK and so they're very important as a carbon storage. Arable land by contrast has quite a lot less carbon uh, in its top uh, 15 centimetres. So th this graph is just a result from the countryside survey just to show you what sort of things have been happening in grassland and this these are from the much smaller plots uh, that are in uh, studied in neutral grassland and they're targeted by surveyors for their higher quality so you'll see that in 1990 these plots had about 16 species and they're only two meters squared so you can see that's quite a high uh, number of species compared to the large plots the 200 meter squared plots which have 20 um, but we, but we what we've seen in countryside survey there's that even in these nice bits uh, so these are probably the semi-natural communities of grassland there's been an ongoing decrease till 2007. Uh, we're waiting for the current round of um, countryside survey to report on whether that's still going down, uh, but slight, it's a slightly depressing message, I have to say. So um, what happens on our grassland? Uh, the vast majority of it is, is heavily managed uh, with, with a small percentage managed by grazing often, uh, but not with inputs under agri-environment schemes. Uh, and, and that grazing is really important for the management of that grassland. But that is probably the 2% that I highlighted in the first slide. Um, the vast majority of grasslands are managed for agricultural production. And that means their practices often include plowing and sowing simple grass grassland mixes which respond well to fertilizer so that's often rye grass and perhaps if you're lucky some clover um, and often fertilizer applications which are particularly good for the rye grass and promotes that above everything else um, continuous grazing often set stocking where the animals will take off the newest growth uh, constantly over a period of several months on the same field perhaps and, and animal wastes so these don't seem like a terribly damaging thing but they can be especially where animals are fed concentrates because uh, the amount of phosphorus going on that land is, is far more than you would expect from just the fertilizer applications. So how do we start to manage these grasslands as nature-based solutions and, and not as uh, detrimental things for the environment and for the grassland themselves? So I think the, the idea is that we need to manage not just for production of food, but also for mitigating climate change and biodiversity loss. And that means working with farmers, uh, seeking to reduce their inputs and, and their costs, actually, so it can be very beneficial for them and improve the long term sustainable management of soil carbon and biodiversity. But it's not just the farmers, you know, it's the rest of us, too. Uh, we need to work with consumers, with retailers, with others in the supply chain to better support production from those systems which are mitigating climate change and biodiversity loss. At the moment, many of the farmers that are trying these approaches are actually almost punished by being certified because they have to pay to be certified. So it's the farmers that are trying to manage their grasslands well are, um, are in effect paying to do that. Whereas the farmers who maybe are not taking so much care don't have to do that to, uh, and, and pay the cost of certification. So it's quite an interesting uh, relationship really between uh, certification and, uh, and produce. So what can we do to mitigate and adapt our semi-natural grasslands? So there are certain things we can definitely do. We need to retain the current extents of semi-natural grasslands and not lose any more. Uh, flood meadows particularly important. They, they really accumulate sediment and carbon uh, and contain high levels of carbon and high levels of species. So we don't want to be building on those areas if we possibly can. Um, restoring semi-natural grassland on less productive land. So where it's agriculturally not that viable but we can maybe have low levels of grazing and high levels of biodiversity we should be trying to restore those areas um, and these this is a sort of anti-grassland restoration so in some parts of the uplands uh, bog and uh, heath has has deteriorated into moorland grass of some sort or another and in those areas they perhaps need re-wetting and reconverting into bog and upland heath because that's what they should naturally be um, and that will be a very good way of mitigating climate uh, for carbon in those habitats 
But there's also the potential for tree planting, particularly on low carbon grassland soils uh, and on always in all agricultural environments, uh, the presence of hedges uh, along field edges is a really good way of uh, um, mitigating carbon. So this is, I just wanted to show you this, just so that you do understand where the UK sits in terms of agricultural production from grassland. It's really very important to us. We are the third biggest producer of beef in Europe. We are the first biggest producer of sheep in Europe, and we are fifth in dairy cows. So it's a really big deal for the UK. Grasslands are important, important economically and uh, for our farming cultures. So how can we mitigate and adapt on these really agriculturally productive grass and are there things that can be done to enhance their species diversity and carbon storage? Well, one thing we can definitely do is retain permanent grassland in situ. So where it's, it's there, let's, let's keep it. Let's not be plowing up and re-sowing with, uh, with ryegrass mixes. Um, and, uh, and the ryegrass mixes often come with high inputs because that, those grass species just do well if you put lots of fertilizer on. So to improve biodiversity, farmers are doing all sorts of things to try and do this, and that includes over sowing after scarifying to allow seed bank regeneration or putting bales of hay in their fields, bales that maybe come from a much more species rich area, rolling them out in their fields, uh, allowing the animals to graze and redeposit the seeds. Um, grazing management itself can be adapted um, for uh, biodiversity enhancement and carbon enhancement and farmers are trying different methods of that. We could certainly include more grassland in our arable areas. And again, farmers are doing this already. They're doing this for pest control. They're doing this because they want more carbon in their soils and they recognize that having grass in their rotation can do that. Um, and we can also perhaps convert some arable land where it's not very productive to grassland. I know we still need to produce food and we perhaps need to produce perhaps less meat and more um, vegetables and, and therefore that's not always a favourable option, but we need to consider each area uh, it, at, for its merits. Okay, so in terms of grazing management, what can be done? We can mix up the grazing, can be have different species, different animals, uh, livestock on the same field can change what, what uh, we get in terms of biodiversity. We can reduce the numbers of livestock. We could graze in a rotation so that the grass gets longer to grow, to develop deep roots, so that maybe you can get more species coming in um, through, uh, through rotational practices. The grass could be longer, it could, uh, you could have flowering species in it that could encourage a different types of biodiversity, invertebrates, mammals, birds. Um, another approach being tried is mob grazing. The picture at the bottom shows a, a farmer that's mob grazing. Um, but I think there's still a lot of research to be done to understand exactly what's the best way of managing our pastures um, for them to be the best they can be for biodiversity, for soil carbon, but also for grazing, for farmers to be able to make a living from them. So our final slide is just a, a quick one from a, the, the project that uh, Honor referred to, the project looking at the Pasture for Life um, organization and their fields. Uh, and the two graphs at the top just show um, how the PFLA fields ranked up against the countryside survey sample. And uh, you can see that the two bars on the right are higher than the bar on the left. And basically the two bars on the right show that the species richness and the forb richness in the pasture fed livestock fields are higher than they are higher and more similar to neutral grassland than they are to the agriculturally improved grassland. And the bottom graph is is what that they get in terms of economic returns for their suckler cows. And the, the uh, bars on the left, the blue bars are the PFLA bars and the bars on the right are the standard farm business survey data. And what that shows you is that the, the blue bars are much bigger than the yellow. So farmers are doing this. They are having more biodiverse farms and they are making a better profit actually in the case of sucklers than your average farmer. Uh, and this is partly because their inputs are lower, um, but it's also because they're producing a better product. So um, um, just to say that uh, I think there are options for enhancing biodiversity for nature-based solutions on our farmland. Um, and, and that's me finished. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, so I actually have a question, which is that the government published their net zero strategy yesterday, um, which failed to mention uh, grasslands at all, but emphasise afforestation targets and tree planting. Uh, do you think that that was a, a missed opportunity or is there a way to kind of balance both? Do we need the government to recognise? Yeah, I think it, I think it really is a missed opportunity. I mean, I'm quite disappointed about that because we gave these talks to the uh, a parliamentary inquiry of the House of Lords, and they were very sure that grasslands were important, uh, and they recognised that. So uh, I, I really hope the government will begin to recognise the grasslands are such a significant part of our ecosystems that we really do need to pay attention to them and making them be what they could be. As opposed to what they are now. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to move over to the other side of the Atlantic and we're going to talk to David. Um, so David has been a faculty member in the University of Nebraska School of Natural Resources and a cooperating faculty with the Center for Grass and Studies since 1998. Uh, with roots in Iowa and Minnesota, he has worked with grassland ecology and conservation since his time at St. Olaf College in the 1970s. Dave's PhD focused on the interaction of grasses with soil carbon and nitrogen cycling, in particular the destabilizing effect of atmospheric nitrogen deposition on high diversity grasslands. Dave oversees research teaching and management at the University of Nebraska's Nine Mile Prairie and Dalby Prairie. I will hand over to you. Thank you, Honor. Um, let me share my screen. I didn't, uh, I wasn't quite sure what angle to take this. And so I was so happy to hear what uh, Jill and Lisa shared and uh, gives me something to build off of here. Uh, I guess before we start, maybe my goals, then I'll give you a potpourri of things. Uh, introduce you to our grasslands. I'm not going to be able to give a whole global survey, but we have Precious joining us from uh, Africa shortly. Uh, but look a little bit at our grassland situation in the middle of North America and our opportunities and challenges. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about and introduce those grasslands and what's left of them. I think it's interesting, uh, just as you are talking about the conservation of semi-natural versus more intensively managed grasslands and conservation and agricultural settings. We have the same discussions, but uh, as you may or may not know, even the definition of what, what, what is natural differs from continent to continent. And that sets lots of philosophical traps for us sometimes. So I've, we'll spend a little bit on that. Uh, I might mention just because it's fascinating in my research, a deep time perspective on on our grasslands globally and how they relate to global change. Uh, and I'll show you a slide or two. And so let's take a 25 million year context. And I literally tell classes, I'm talking about the battle for the soul of the North American Great Plains between trees and grasses. And this has gone on for 25 million years and we're in the newest chapter, which is fascinating. Uh, and I don't know if we want to uh, honor and I would enjoy chatting about just the politics of agricultural policy and grassland conservation, because that's huge. So let me share a screen, just give you a little context here. Um, um, oh my goodness. The, uh, I just realized I didn't rehearse that well enough. I have a new Macintosh finally, new computer. Let me just, uh, let me just talk a little bit, okay? Uh, and as I said, I didn't have a highly polished presentation for you anyway. So Nebraska, we're in the middle of North America. Uh, historically, uh, Nebraska and South Dakota vied for the lowest proportion of trees on the landscape prior to European settlement we were about 3% and most people give the prize to Nebraska. So we were the most grassland state of the United States uh, prior to settlement. Uh, about 50% of Nebraska is still grassland. 
Uh, and the rest of that is pretty much corn and soybeans. We are now, Nebraska is the most irrigated state in the country, drawing on the vast groundwater resources that are recharged by our remaining 50% of the grasslands in the state. Uh, of the half of the state, which is grassland, uh, about half of that, a quarter of Nebraska is the sand hills, which if you haven't learned about, I enjoy, encourage you to come and visit. Uh, it is one of the amazing grassland landscapes of the world. Oh, I'm, Wendy said you can't see my shared screen. That's because my shared screen didn't work. I'm sorry, Wendy. Um, and uh, the, uh, so the sand hills are the largest sand dune complex in the Western hemisphere. They were mobile from our research as recently as the medieval warm period. So that's 900 to 1,000 years ago. Uh, but now they're a vast natural grassland, almost entirely privately owned as rangeland. Uh, another aspect of the story of Nebraska is that we're 95% privately owned land, unlike some of the Western states in the US, which have great, huge federal land holdings. So uh, the battles over grassland conservation and carbon sequestration in the future are gonna be largely fought on private lands and the sort of things that Lisa was just talking about. How do we, how do we uh, optimize carbon storage and biodiversity on private working grasslands that have to pay taxes, have to raise some commodity that can be sold, okay? So, uh, Eastern Nebraska, the eastern third of Nebraska is tall grass prairie. Most of that's gone. As Jill said, maybe 1% of the tall grass prairie remains. Uh, that's because these were the great rich black soils, we call them mollusols or chernosomes, that Midwest agriculture is built upon. So that was almost entirely converted to row crop agriculture. And tiny fragments remain of the tall grass prairie. Interestingly, after over 100 years of agriculture, uh, on average, we've lost 40% of that soil organic matter from those prairie soils, yet they're still some of the more productive soils in the world. They started at about 5% soil organic matter. Uh, and so uh, even that significant loss, there's still a lot of carbon. Uh, then when we get to the sand hills, we're down to like 0.75% carbon or percent organic matter in the soil, considerably less, but still it's just a vast landscape. We're talking 50 million acres of sand hills grassland in native vegetation that's managed by private ranchers. Okay. Um, the, uh, so I wanted to mention a little bit about um, one of the maps I would have shown you was a quote map of the natural vegetation of Nebraska. And one of the struggles for North Americans in grassland conservation is the concern about, I would use the word preserve, preserving and restoring our natural grasslands. And that's usually defined as pre-European settlement, which in, in Nebraska is about 1850 for most of this land being plowed up, uh, to look at the sort of changes that we've seen in North America uh, in our Great Plains grasslands over the last 150 years, you would have to go back to the Neolithic in the initial tree clearing in Britain and Northern Europe. So, uh, uh, Amer so one of the struggles is this, we can see in a ever increasing faint mirror what these grasslands looked like 150 years ago. Uh, the bison would have left Eastern Nebraska by 1850 and been shot out. And uh, the indigenous peoples, those wars ended by the end of the 1800s. Uh, and most of Eastern Nebraska was plowed up and given away as homesteads by the government. And so uh, it relatively within 100 years, 150 years, that landscape's been transformed. And so there's this longing to preserve our little remnants of tall grass prairie that are left. Uh, like Jill said, maybe 1%. A lot of emphasis on restoring those grasslands, replanting grasslands, uh, maybe road verges, but certainly in fields or areas that had been disturbed. Um, 
and uh, and then I think the main man, one of the main man, and then how to manage these areas to conserve them as natural areas. So if you can imagine, we have some small proportion of Nebraska, uh, which is owned by the government or by the Nature Conservancy or World Wildlife Fund or Audubon Society or somebody for conservation, and then we have all these working lands. One of the controversies in conservation in North America has been to how do the program, how does the, the conservation on private lands, which is subsidized by state and federal agencies, heavily by the, the federal government, the US Department of Agriculture, what role do those plans, lands play in conservation, whether it's pollinators and biodiversity or whether it's carbon sequestration? And how do those lands, those working lands, complement our natural areas, our last remnants that we fought so hard for of, say, tall grass prairie? Um, I'm responsible for managing several of those remnants. Um, and uh, one of the programs I'll just mention, and this maybe relates back to the numbers that Jill said. <laughs> yeah, you could say, well, we're, lo you know, we've lo we're losing half a million acres of grasslands. I think she mentioned like uh, maybe every year or something like that. Uh, through government programs and driven by international prices of corn and soybean and ethanol, we have lots of grassland areas moving in and out. Uh, Nebraska alone, which is 50 million acres in size, um, we have uh, almost within 20 years, we put 1.5 million acres into grassland in the, 18, in the 1990s and 2000s through a program called Conservation Reserve Program to try to take land out of corn and soybean production. In the around 2009 to 2011, half a million of those grassland acres came back out. And that was that interaction of high prices for commodities and then the ethanol, biofuels, boom. Uh, now we're starting to put those lines back in. In Nebraska, the federal government pays Nebraska landowners over $100 million a year to do these conservation practices on private lands. And so increasingly, I, I'm optimistic, we're working together to say, how can we enhance seed mixes for pollinators? How can we enhance management for soil carbon sequestration? How can we uh, improve the ecosystem services we get from this massive investment we make into our private grasslands uh, in Nebraska? So I'm gonna stop there, Honor. Uh, that's just a, some thoughts on what we're doing. Uh, I invite you to look at the Center for Grassland Studies website we have a series of lectures and uh, videos that we've done and neat stuff or contact me. Thank you very much. That's incredibly useful. Um, and I just had had one question. You mentioned the USDA um, and I'm aware that the, the farm bill is coming up. And obviously, President Biden has re-entered the or has indicated that he's re-entering the Paris Agreement and he's going to be in Glasgow. I just wondered if you might uh, have some brief thoughts on how the Farm Bill might be able to reflect those climate priorities going forward. Yeah, the Farm Bill happens every four or five years. Uh, and like I said, even Nebraska alone, it's a, it's you know probably half a billion dollars over five years in funding. So it's crop insurance, it's conservation programs, it's pheasants, it's butterflies, it's everything. And uh, I, I, I'm, the Farm Bill will sort out, I think there'll be more emphasis the, uh, you may be familiar with this 30 by 30 concept, which is somewhat international and, and the Biden administration said, this is one of our goals. Well, unfortunately, like everything, I mean, if you folks in Britain thought your Brexit controversies were large, you maybe realize that the culture wars going on in the US right now are intense and anything, including conservation on cooperative private agricultural lands has become controversial. And so the 30 by the idea that we would have 30% of our landscape in a quote natural state, if we can define that for carbon sequestration and biodiversity by the year 2030, uh, that, that was the, this kind of national effort. 
And uh, even though the program said it is very conscious of private property rights and working on working lands as well as conserved areas, um, our governor in Nebraska has just chosen this as a culture war currently um, as an attack on private landowners. So it will sort out, stay tuned, more to come from the US and the culture wars. Um, and conservation of grasslands to our dismay has fallen right into the middle of this culture war with everybody else. And what role does the federal government have in encouraging carbon sequestration and pollinators on private grasslands? Well, that sounds like a whole conversation in and of itself. So maybe- Yeah, I got that. a lot I could talk about. <laughs> Bring me back another time. Exactly. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Precious uh, to talk about the work that she's doing in Zimbabwe. Uh, so Precious is a training and development specialist in regeneration, uh, regenerative agricultural issues, an educator of holistic management and a seasoned community organizer in Zimbabwe. She founded an organization and network Earth Wisdom to inspire change. And she is also on a steering committee member and an Africa coordinator for Regeneration International. Um, Precious has a very good video um, that she asked me to share. Do you want me to set it up at the start or would you like to just tell me when you want it? Um, hi everyone, I think let's, let's play it at the start and then I'll just talk. Um, it's just a minute long. All right, let me share my screen and hopefully this will all work seamlessly. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I wanted to share that video um, to reflect on at least some of my experiences with uh, working in the grassland sphere as an educator in holistic management, working with communal farmers here in Africa. I'm based in Zimbabwe. And uh, as you saw, some of that video is showing um, land that is managed communally, land that is managed as reserves or national parks. And um, those two lands have got a common problem, which is massive degradation and worsening and advancing deserts. And then you have land, which is uh, one of the, the first several uh, hub actually called the Africa Center for Holistic Management, where I worked uh, for 10 years. And now we continue to partner because uh, we continue to work with communities around uh, this region in Zimbabwe. And as an accredited professional, I work with that hub as a place for learning, uh, using the tools of uh, holistic grazing and animal impact. The land is completely healed and totally different from lands that are surrounding it with the best management uh, possible. And so I'm just going to share a little bit of my journey and experiences and uh, some reflections on um, what I feel uh, has been some of my lessons in this journey. And um, thank you so much to Plant Life and everyone who's spoken ahead of me. So first of all, I think it's uh, prudent to give a bit of a context uh, of the places where I work. I work mostly with communal farmers, both agro-pastoral and pastoralists. So uh, these are two different communities because also the economic drivers are different and uh, what they're passionate about is also very different. 
but both of them are impacted in the same way by advancing desertification and harsh conditions that are caused by climate change. And when we look at the continent in itself, about two thirds of our continent is degraded. Um, these are forests and both uh, and grasslands as well. I mean, in most cases, farmers uh, face extremities of weather patterns and their cropping um, attempts also fail. And remembering that the African continent in itself is taken care of by about 80% 80 80 of the food comes from smallholder farmers. And uh, thankfully, there's lots of groups also that are working to improve the smallholder farmers as well as broader landscape restoration work um, that goes on. There's about 13 million square kilometers of savanna grasslands in the African continent. There's about almost half of the continent is made of grasslands. These grasslands um, co-evolved with uh, large grazing animals. And uh, over time and land use changes, uh, we've seen a rapid degradation of these lands, advancing of you know, recent man-made deserts. Um, so obviously loss of species and uh, grassland capacity to store carbon as well as being water sinks uh, to take care of our animals and human populations. Um, so there's lots of loss in biodiversity, that's for sure, but also instability in the social and economic uh, securities of the people populations as well as other living systems. Um, so I'm going to share just uh, quickly, I am aware of our time as well, um, but on the importance of functioning grazing uh, ecosystems or functioning grasslands. Um, they are vital for ecosystem services and also of fundamental importance for sustaining human life and uh, all forms of life that depend on these ecosystems. Um, they service the soil's ability to hold water, to hold carbon, and here we had lots of good data uh, on those that have done a wider research about this grassland's capability to store carbon. And um, in, in more than that, when the grasslands have got enough cover, uh, we realize that the infiltration and ability to hold water recharges underground water storages, giving life to rivers and water supplies to communities that are farming and wildlife habitat as well, because we are uh, we have lots of tents, but for example, if you were to visit now a place and because uh, of advancing desertification. So I'm an accredited professional with the Savory Institute. We train communities and uh, one of my roles is to really simplify the language of ecological literacy to bring it to the communities who are so tied to their land culturally and have evolved with these landscapes. And my role has been to simplify that information. And the structure that we use in the Savory Institute is to create nodes or what we call hubs across the world so that that each population can heal their grasslands, uh, respecting bioregional uh, context as well as cultural relevance. And, and in most cases also, uh, when people heal their own land, it also helps their own economic drivers so that they thrive in their own terms. So I think holistic management is really rooted uh, and it was founded by Alan Savory, this whole big network. But holistic management as a decision-making framework or as a management framework is to enable biological thriving, social thriving and economic thriving for communities without jeopardizing the ecosystems that they depend on, which I think is uh, what regeneration is as well as agroecology. Um, in other terms. Um, so at Seven, we have 31 hubs that uh, span the whole globe. And currently we have 16 more that are in training that spread across the world. And these are meant to be centers of showing the examples that are uh, uh, using the holistic management tools are, um, are producing. So I work with smallholder farmer groups and uh, most of the times the dynamics are very different um, and, and difficult in a sense because there's lots of social organizing for these groups that are healing landscapes. In a private owned farm, decision is very usually very easy because a farmer can decide, oh, okay, grassland is not good and I have this set of tools with me and this is how I'm going to do it. Uh, but when working with communities, especially in the tenure system, we deal with less commonly owned um, 
community managed rather and state owned. So there's lots of dialogue and uh, digging on the importance of how we relate to our land, as well as how we co-evolved with our land, uh, showing mostly how wild large animals uh, helped the African rangelands to heal while being chased or being moved by cutters. So use these pictures, which is things that uh, people have known for years and have evolved with for years. And so that information, you bring it down to ecological literacy and what can be our role right now in reversing the current state of our land. And the tools that we're using is what we call the tool of uh, holistic uh, plant grazing and animal impact. Holistic plant grazing is the actual act of animals or graziers eating on the grass and animal impact is their behavior on the land their behavior on the land when they are moved uh, by people herding or when wild animals are moved by lions or hyenas they tend to group together their hooves chip the land they dung and urinate on that land and because they've stayed in those areas for so long they keep moving so we are Im 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 uh, mimicking that same uh, setup but using stock livestock, small stock and large stock, depending on what community you work with. I've also worked with communities that use um, well, what you call it, camel, and we've worked with trained farmers that use horses. And so this, the principles are the same, but tools or the kind of tool may be a little bit different. And um, so uh, a bit of on the broadness of the results. So when people actually managed the grazing systems, we've seen that it improves a lot of the ecosystem services. And uh, people's, uh, there's one farmer actually who has increased the animals on the same piece of land. So that means the grazing in itself has also improved. The rangeland improves. And uh, here at the Africa Center, we have a small river stream that does not dry even on the driest of years it continues to have pools so you are uh, improving your water storage on underground and some people also use the same principles and methods to improve cropping and they get double to three times more harvest which brings in food security and sovereignty as well um so what are the opportunities of managing these grasslands the biggest opportunity is the improvement of ecosystem processes um, I realized that my time is almost up, but I wanted to run through that in a, in a little bit, which is the solar energy flow, maximizing photosynthesis by green plants. Uh, so using green plants as solar panels. Usually what we say is when your land is sponsored by photosynthesis, your dollars, we call them solar dollars. So they are not depleting uh, other natural resources. And then we have a max uh, water cycle improvement, which is the maximization of soil as a carbon storage as well as water storage. And then a uh, mineral cycle, which ensures that uh, a biologically active soil uh, will always have plants available with minerals and mineral balance. And then you also have uh, community dynamics or succession, which is complex and diverse which makes you have uh, a resilient and stronger land. And also the potential of improving economic and social drivers for these groups, because when the land thrives, the people in it also thrive. So there's lots of pictures and things to share, but for now, I can probably share in the chat a resource uh, a connection to the Savory Institute, so that those who want to read more about holistic management can go there. Oh, nice. um, thank you. That was really quick. <laughs> thank you. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating and I could listen to you talk for hours on this. Um, I just as we're wrapping up, I was just wondering if you might be able to offer um, just a moment or a gl glimpse into a moment when you were working with a community that suddenly really got it. You know, you talked a lot about how you kind of have to talk to them and engage with them and, and make them understand so that they embrace it. I was just wondering if you had a little anecdote of when someone suddenly saw what you were talking about, suddenly got it. Um, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, thanks. I'd love to share that. And I can share an experience of as early as last week. So um, most of the times, because of what communities have gone through, 
So you find that the thought processes of communities are more towards scarcity, and therefore that's why we become extractive and we want to keep amassing and um, keeping things to ourselves. And so the language has been, okay, so let's think even with our rangelands or grasslands or how we relate to one to another, I think this can never be separated. And so we always say, let's think abundantly, abundance thinking. And um, someone last week got it immediately and uh, they said, well, you know, abundance can still flip and be, I'll still amass and be abundant by myself. But then when we say abundance and generosity, because now you're translating, we're also using local language. But we came up with a, frame, a, a phrase that means abundance as well as uh, generosity, which means I, I abound as a person, but also I plant back to my land so that everything around me also thrives. So I think, uh, I thought that was really incredible. That's the discussion fine. coming from a training, yeah. That's really amazing. And I really like that as the idea that, you know, yes, we're, we're healing, our, you know, we've, we've destroyed so much of the environment through industrialization, but actually by giving back to these grasslands, we're restoring ourselves and restoring our homelands too. And it's that kind of mutual benefit. Um, and so someone, someone just sent a question, sorry, Anna, they're asking if we have seed saving or local seed sharing initiatives. Yes, because we work with both cropping and uh, uh, pastoral communities. So I run, I actually have groups that have seed saving. So right now they are busy working on their fields and we are multiplying seeds and we celebrate seed fairs and field fairs. So yes, uh, to be brief. Brilliant. Well, I think um, hopefully some people have answered the questions uh, on the chat. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, there were a lot um, and it was a fascinating session, but I hope you will appreciate the, the wonderful insights that our panelists have been able to give us today. Um, so I will invite everyone to come back onto the screen so we can just say a big virtual round of applause um, to our incredible panelists and a big thank you. I'm sure you all uh, will join me in that. Um, and, and yes, thank you all very much for joining and for joining Plant Life Session. Bye. Thank you. Bye.